Yes, the idea of these uh, webinars, this webinar series was to, to basically finish up Solstice and to, to have a look back at what we've achieved and over the, the period of, it's really three and a half years, I guess. Um, and yeah, this is a good way of doing that. So, so we're gonna have a, several talks, um, not all of them. They won't address the whole project, obviously, but they'll just be some sort of bite-sized little um, um, sort of pieces of the work. And I should just, as it says over here, any questions from anyone, you can type in the questions and the answer column um or raise your hand i guess that's the other way of doing it um so the agenda uh we are starting at i see it's 12 o'clock there on south african time it's actually one o'clock um so it doesn't really matter we're here um we're going to have a couple of remarks from from the stakeholders which looks like adrian will be here we'll show the mooc then I'll show a couple of slides, just giving us the oversight, the overview of the project. And then uh, we're gonna have a, a talk from um, Mogo on the field campaign. And then Mo, uh, Katia will launch the deep sea research special issue, take some questions, have a bit of a break. And then we've got a bunch of talks that um, just give us sort of nice little examples of the kind of work we did. So that's it. Um, Adrian, I guess, it hand, we hand over to you for a couple of opening remarks. Thanks, thanks Mike, and thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Adrian Smith. I'm chairman of SASMIA, which is the SA Squid Management Industrial Association. Um, and we represent 95% um, of the commercial businesses in the squid sector in South Africa. And I'm just going to give you some history of that sector and just some of the background re relating to the 2013 crash. Um, so the squid sector started in the early 1980s, uh, mainly with ski boats and initially wet fish vessels. Um, and initially, nobody knew where to sell the squid, so it, it was a slow start. Um, but pretty soon, some of the marketing people got involved and figured out that it was the same species as in Europe and Japan, um, and that the price was good enough to, to apply some effort to catching it. So... Within 10 years, the fleet went from a ski boat sector to fully commercialized sea freezing vessels um, by the early 90s. Uh, and from no, no one involved in it in 1980, uh, we reached a, a peak of about 2,500 crew with 500 support staff, um, which has been the situation since about 1990 onwards. Um, that uh, the sector has been pretty erratic in terms of catches over the years, but always within a band of between 6,000 and 10,000 tons, um, which on a per man basis equates to, to a crew person catching between three, probably two and a half and 5,000 um, kilos per year. Um, and based on that, uh, the sustainability of the sector, the ability to invest in sea freezing vessels um, was fine. Uh, and that led to the development of, of the sector as it, as it stood. Um, in 2013, or rather in 2012, we were at the bottom end of, of the catch cycle in terms of, I think 2012, we caught 6,000 tons, um, and which was still fine. That was the lower end of the norm, uh, which was about two, two and a half thousand tons per man. And 2013, uh, the wheels came off totally. So I think the total catch for that year dropped to two, two and a half thousand tons, which was just over one ton per man. Um, and given that the crew, the 3,000 crew and the support people earn based on whatever the catches are, it, it was pretty much a disaster for, for the sector. Um, thankfully, in 2014, it recovered back to a sort of bottom end of the norm. Um, and 2015, and then after that, recovered back into the normal cycle of some some good years, some bad years, but never never below 6,000 tons. So the 2013 sort of crash of two and a half thousand tons was significant. Had it continued, um, I don't think the sector would still have been here. Um, and just to give the context, the Eastern Cape is one of the poorest sectors in or areas in South Africa. So so 3,000 people earning 
um, earning a, a wage for um, for the whole year is important, and they support probably twenty thousand people in in the Eastern Cape. Um, so, given given the the changes, we uh, one of the things that that did happen after twenty thirteen was that from catching for eleven months of the year, the industry together with with DEF uh, agreed to cut cut the season, and we introduced an additional closed season of three months. Um, and nobody knows whether that was part of the reason the fishing recovered, um, because at the end of the day, we still don't know what the cause was for the crash. Um, and therefore, from an industry point of view, while we, we're glad that things have come back, we don't want to see it happen again. And we are very happy that the Solstice Project was put together and has done some of the investigations and hopefully will be able to tell us uh, what the factors were that caused it, um, and we're looking forward to to the final results and, and putting all of the different papers together to see um, what the answer, what the answer is. Um, and just to say thank you from our side to all of the researchers, to Mike and his team, um, and all the effort that's gone in into this. Um, from our point of view, at the moment we're fine, but if it happens again, a we would like to predict beforehand so that if we need to do some mitigation, we can. Um, and yeah, it's, it's the sustainability of the whole sector really depends on the resource. Um, given that the squid only lasts for a year, uh, it's very difficult if a crash like this happened and it didn't recover, um, that would put all of us and our investment sort of, our investments would be worthless and it would put basically 20,000 people um, would no longer have a livelihood. Um, so just to say thanks to the team and for all that you've you've done and we look forward to the synthesis of the entire project and and what the result is. And if you can predict where we should be fishing next season, then um, that would be great too. Thank you. Wonderful. Adrian, you're a natural always. Um, that was a fantastic overview, thanks. Thanks. Um, and I think I don't have any questions because I was going to ask you to just give us an update on the catches and you've already done that. So. You covered all bases. Uh, yeah, season opens tomorrow. So, and we're in, we're in the midst of a fishing rights allocation process. So that also at open today, so. Yeah, very exciting <laughs> for, for you guys. I see Jean is, is struggling in the background. Uh, she says the audio is breaking up. Are you there, Jean? I think she's, she's um, on the attendee side, so. If I could make her a panelist, she'll be able to speak to us. Okay, Jean, I don't know if you can hear that, but Amani's going to pull some magic out of the box there. Fingers crossed. Yes. Is she there, Jean? Yes. <laughs> you just muted. She might have fallen asleep already. Oh, Hello, we go. Here we go. Um, it's back. <laughs> I just um, rejoined as a panelist. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry for the yeah brain still at sea. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, Adrian, for interrupting. Adrian's finished, but you uh, still no doubt after getting off the ship. Sorry? I said you're still wobbling around after getting off the ship. Yeah, I'm landsick. <laughs> yeah, you're landsick. Jean, um, you know, you, you represent uh, DEFA, um, or DFFE, as you call now. Um, Adrian's given us a wonderful overview from SASMIA's point of view. Maybe you've got a few comments from the management side, from the Squid Working Group. Yeah, sure. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the invite. So um, yeah, Adrian's given quite a good overview. <coughs> Excuse me. So from our side as a, as a department, um, obviously this was uh, of concern to us, the way the stocks almost collapsed. It wasn't a crash, as Mike likes to call it, but they almost collapsed in 2013. Um, and uh, there was a similar 
reduction in catches on the south coast, but it was also the one year that as a department, we didn't have a, a survey on the south coast. So it was really difficult for us to determine what was, uh, you know, the reason for this. And, you know, it was a genesis or part of the genesis for this project. So we know it's the environment. So uh, from as a department, we've been waiting uh, quite anxiously for these results, especially um, as I was telling Mike, you know, this is part of the science to governance aspect of this project. And we are just, uh, we just completed reviewing all the policies for the government. Uh, for the for the different uh, fishery sectors and as well as the general policy for uh, our fisheries so this is a this is perfect if the information we can get out of this is something that can actually be uh, put into the policies or we can adopt into the policies uh, so that we can better manage the fishery um, you know um, so it's um, so some of the results I know will be results that you can't really put into management. Some of the scenarios that I've seen that some of the results that have come out, some of this, you know, looking about the 80 year projections or whatever, we've just reallocated part of this fishery as probably Adrian pointed out to the small scale guys. And some of the projections show that the catches are going to drop dramatically going forward. So as government, do we then, uh, so what do we do? How do we use this information to better manage the fishery? Can we start, is it a time to be allocating to small scale fisheries when you know that the forecast is going to be a decline of the stocks? So uh, this information is really important for us as government, the kind of results that we're going to look at today. And uh, as Mike said, I just uh, we just completed a, a cruise. We're doing an acoustic survey of the entire uh, spawning grounds for squid, or at least 80 percent of it. And it's the most thorough survey that's ever been carried out, I think, for the South African coastline, probably in any coastline. So we had a uh, survey grids uh, lines running uh, from, uh, you're probably not familiar with the area, but say 80% of the squid spawning grounds. And these lines had a spacing of one nautical mile in between them. And we also did environmental um, uh, collective environmental data. So we did CTDs and bongos. Um, and then the lines were also interleaved. So we probably covered um, the area within, we, we surveyed each part of the coastline, I think within a quarter of a nautical mile uh, after completion of the survey, because we surveyed going from west to east and back uh, three or four times. Or no script. We were out there for three weeks. There's like hardly any squid. So the question is, where are they? Um, and you know, the fishery is opening tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be reopening the fishery. Um, so can we say that we're going to have a good uh, season or not? Because we didn't. We hardly found anything. There was hardly any sign of spawning activity. No, really little sign of eggs. Um, and even individual squid were few and far between. And we surveyed the coastline intensively. So this is a question. Are we having a, is, is there something going on uh, along the coast at the moment? Are we having a La Nina or El Nino a year or season? Uh, because they were there. There were lots of small pelagic fish, but hardly any squid. So, so this kind of, uh, yeah, we might have, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say that we're going to have a year like 2013, but it could be, we, this, these low catches seem to have like a seven, six year cycle. So uh, really looking forward to seeing some uh, results uh, from this really intense study, but also we'll be writing up uh, what you've seen from our survey, which is uh, going to be very interesting to look at. So, yeah. That's all from me. Yeah, that, that was a hell of a lot of information. Thank you, Jean. Um, and it's interesting. It contextualizes very much what we, we're talking about. And it's sort of nice. Solstice is winding down and you're sort of really refreshing the whole situation for us. So both Adrian and Jean, many thanks for your, 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 your comments. Um, I don't know if you want to, I know you want to go to bed telling me so feel free to I'll, go to I'll definitely stick around because this is important so yeah
Great. Moni, I think it's over to you, hey? Hey, thank you. Thank you, Jean and Adrian, for, for those for, for all that information. That's really, really interesting. Um, I'm just going to run um, one of our MOOC videos now, which is uh, an introduction to this the squid fishery. Um, fishery. So uh, a general overview, um, as, but we've already heard a lot of details. So I think we can bear all that in mind while we watch the watch the MOOC video. This lecture introduces the South African squid fishery. It provides a quick overview of the chocker squid life cycle, the fishery, fluctuations in landings, its value in the international market, impacts of the environment and the people who depend on the catches for a livelihood. This lecture was written by Professor Warwick Sauer, a fishery scientist in the Department of Ichthyology and Fishery Science at Rhodes University, who specialises in cephalopods, and by Professor Mike Roberts from the Nelson Mandela University, a physical oceanographer with strong leanings into marine ecosystem functioning. You will learn about one of the most important fisheries in the world, the South African squid fishery. And you will learn that fisheries are not only about fish, they are about people too, who are at the mercy of environmental change. Chocker squid, or Laliga renaudi, to give it the correct scientific name, is a cephalopod and is closely related to the cuttlefish and octopus. Chocker, as it is locally known, is sold and eaten as calamari in restaurants. It is one of the most sought after species around the world because of its texture and flavour. It is found on the west and south coasts of South Africa, but concentrates along the south coast where it breeds. The squid fishery is one of the most important in South Africa, with about 120 vessels fishing each year. The vessels range in length from 12 to about 20 metres and stay at sea for typically three weeks at a time. The fleet operates out of Port Elizabeth and Port St Francis. These squid form large breeding concentrations targeted by the fishing vessels. The females lay thousands of eggs on the seabed, which at times span areas about half the size of a football field. Spawning tends to be coastal, at depths of around 20 to 30 metres, but it can be as deep as 120 metres. Chocker are caught by hand using jigs made from lead or plastic, which have an array of barbless hooks. Fishers operate two hand lines at a time to catch the squid. The boats carry up to 26 crew who do the fishing. Fishers are paid individually for their catch. The squid are sorted by size, cleaned using seawater and then placed in trays that go into a blast freezer. Once frozen, squid are placed into plastic packets and placed in a holding freezer. The larger vessels can carry as much as 40 tonnes. Powerful lights are used at night to attract squid to the boats. These lights are even visible from space and can be tracked on satellite images. In the harbour, the frozen squid catch is transferred to the factory, which are then placed in boxes sorted by size, ready for export to markets in Europe, notably Portugal and Spain. 99% of the squid caught in South Africa is exported, with South Africans eating imported squid of lower quality at a cheaper price. South African squid fetches one of the highest prices in the world. Squid catches vary considerably on a monthly and annual basis. Consequently, fisher earnings vary largely. Times of poor catches, such as in 2013, results in economic hardship. Many have large families that rely on the income from the squid fishery, living as close to the ports as possible, often in less than ideal conditions. It is estimated that some 35,000 people are dependent on the squid fishery, in a province where economic opportunities are very limited. As a measure of controlling the fishery, the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, through legislation, limits the number of vessels and crew, and in addition has established two closed fishing seasons. Five weeks in October-November and 12 weeks between March and June, to protect spawning squid. This means that the fishers have no income during these months. A striking characteristic of squid is that they live fast and die young, with lifespans of only 18 months. This means years of good and poor recruitment have very large impacts on the annual biomass and hence catches. 
Squid are particularly sensitive to the environment during the spawning and early life cycle stages. Factors such as turbid water conditions affect spawning behaviour, with the amount of upwelling, and hence productivity in the ocean, impacting the survival of the minute paralarvae. Also, they live in one of the most complex and energetic ocean environments on the planet, a place where three oceans meet, superimposed with one of the most powerful western boundary currents, the Agulhas Current. Together, these factors strongly influence recruitment in the squid fishery. As in other parts of the world's ocean, changes associated with global warming are also becoming evident. In the next lecture, we will explore the biology of chocker squid to find out how the environment affects recruitment. So that was one of our, um, our MOOC videos to give everyone a, a nice overview of, um, of the squid fishery and the squid life cycle. <clears throat> um, and next up, we have Mike. Mike again. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Moni. Do you just want um, to share your screen and give your presentation? I, I, I will do. Um, So let's just all these little gremlins. Why is that not showing now? Hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, for some reason, on the entire PowerPoint's gone blank. Uh, we'll get it up and running. We're almost there, everyone. Sorry almost there. I've just had to reopen it and hopefully you can see it now. Zoom has these little situations every now and again. Can you see the screen? That's a very nice introduction. Oops, to the <laughs> How do I switch that sound off? Uh, I will provide a brief project overview. The key I don't question. Know. Um, okay, I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. The science. I'm going to actually move it out of can you guys still see that? I know it's on, it's not presentation mode. Amani, can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so, um, all right. So if you guys can bear with that. Um, so with, with, it, with, with it being in, in non-presentation mode. So, okay, what I wanted to do was just pull out a little bit of, um, the golden nuggets from that lovely um, movie, that, that MOOC, which shows it beautifully. Um, and then I want to just uh, give some, some an overview quickly of the project and the key, key questions and move on to the hypotheses. So as, as the movie sort of said, just some quick golden nuggets is that you find squid all over the, the South Coast and, and the West Coast. And as they say in the movie, very nicely is the, the squid move into the Eastern Cape area to spawn. And you can see that in beautifully in this picture over here. And what I always like to just remind people is that there's a, it's, we call it a nuptial dance here. And you can see the male and the female going down to the seabed. The males protect the females while they go down to, to lay their eggs. Um, but also what wasn't quite maybe emphasized in that uh, in the MOOC is that the fleet as shown here in this left hand number three picture is constantly hunting. You've got what is it 123 vessels out there that are literally 24 hours a day busy hunting and as they show very nicely in the MOOC once they they find them the anchor and then they catch them by hand. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the MOOC emphasizes the importance of this fishery in the impoverished Eastern Cape province. Adrian, I noticed you mentioned um, that about 2,400 fishes um, with some 20,000 dependents. And it seems that it might be a little bit bigger. It's around 35,000 dependents now uh, are the latest estimates. Um, and I think these pictures quite nicely 
uh, graphically show that dependence. And uh, again, this was shown in the MOOC, um, just re-emphasizing that there were some other crashes. 1990, you can see over here, there was a crash, uh, another one in uh, 2001. I know Gene doesn't like me using this word crash, but it's dramatic and I think it fits the part quite nicely. And then of course, this big one over here in 2013, that was an 80% drop. And, and of course, as Adrian mentioned in his opening remarks, this has got devastating consequences, not only for the, the fishery, the, the industrial side, but for the, the social side as well. So yeah, having had the MOOC and those golden nuggets, you can see quite naturally how the key questions dropped out of this lot. You know, what caused them? Adrian, you mentioned this. Um, can we predict them? These are very obvious. Um, and given that climate change is with us for the foreseeable future, and those of you who watched COP, I was, I was really quite dismayed um, that in fact, it looks like we're gonna be on a business as usual emissions type scenario, which they call the RCP 8.5. And so, yeah, I guess we need to prepare ourselves for climate change. It's not going away. And so obviously one of the uh, things we want to know, Adrian, um, I think Gene, you mentioned it, what's gonna happen to the, the squid fishery? So there's the key questions. Um, just to emphasize that the MOOC didn't emphasize fully is that that this particular fishery and the life cycle of the squid, Loligo, Renaudi, um, occur in possibly one of the most dynamic and complex oceanographic systems in the world, shelf oceanographic systems in the world. Um, and that's, I tried to many years ago portray that in this little picture down on the bottom right hand side, which many of you have seen in publications. It's a cartoon, but I think it's the only one that actually exists. Um, and just to mention some of the features, you've got this coastal upwelling along the, the, the south coast, depicted here by these white sort of um, plumes with little dots in there. And this is completely wind driven. Um, and the top picture over there, uh, near number nine, the little point number nine shows these two uh, high pressure cells on either side of the continent in the South Atlantic and the South Indian. And you've got the Wesley wind belt just over here. And this whole system migrates north and south with the seasons. So during summer, you get the, the, the highs coming down and that drives the, the easterly winds, which drives the west, uh, the, the strong upwelling. And then of course, on the outside of the Agulhas uh, uh, Bank, you've got arguably one of the most powerful Western boundary currents on the planet, the Agulhas, Agulhas Current, um, which has got a myriad of sort of features, Natal pulses and eddies, uh, and meanders and stuff, which all influence the shelf waters. And the picture on the left, number 11 there, point 11, which is a color image of chlorophyll. It's a composite. Um, in other words, we've joined two or three of these uh, other images, daily images together to try and sort of emphasize these main things. But you can see the upwelling along the coast, the red over there, which is high phytoplankton, and then the Port Alfred upwelling more offshore with E and D in the picture. And then you've got this, this infamous cold ridge that we have known about for many, many years, but haven't really understood it at all. And another, another feature um, that unfortunately this, let me just move this big thing out the way. Um, another feature of this Agulhas Bank system are these um, nephiloid um, uh, layers, these benthic layers you get on the bottom. And of course, Gene did a PhD on this. And these are two uh, pictures on the right. Those survey maps are from Gene's PhD um, that she did on nephloid layers. And, and the cartoon on the left-hand side, this box over here with the surface and 30 meters, tries to just illustrate to those of you who are not too familiar with these phenomena that, that um, what it is, is you've got a whole bunch of particles down near the seabed, some five to 10 meters in thickness. And when you dive down to them and Brett in the background there is an expert on this, he's gonna talk on it. Um, it, it just cuts out all the light. And, um, it, and Brett will talk to that later on. And these features from Gene's work we could see were uh, sort of especially sporadic. Um, in this top um, 2003 cruise, you can see there was a very strong event uh, near Port Alfred, another one near 
at St. Francis Bay. And then in 2006, those areas were cleaner and there were more nephloid layers along the eastern, uh, the western side of the bank. Um, so, so with that very brief sort of overview, two slide overview, overview of this dynamic oceanographic environment, we then came up with OK4 hypotheses, what could be causing these, these so-called crashes. And so these, these guided a lot of the research, 99% of the research, all the papers um, that Katia will talk to you in a moment or just mention. So the first hypothesis was that there could have been an increase in benthic turbidity events. Um, and from our understanding of years of research, these animals need to talk to one another. Um, and if you have nephloid layers, it basically stops the spawning process. And so you're not going to get any catches. And Brett's going to uh, do a talk on that and elaborate more. And then the hypothesis number two was what we called paralarvae starvation. And we sort of attached this to the absence or the less intenseness of the cold ridge feature that I pointed out in D in that picture before. Um, and that this thing is, is found normally with quite a lot of zooplankton um, on this, uh, although Margot um, would love to talk to that, I'm sure. Um, she would disagree with that. Uh, but traditionally, we all thought in the past that the zooplankton were very strongly linked to that. And we, the, this hypothesis sort of says, OK, if there's hardly any cold ridge, there's going to be no paralarvae. And so the animals going to the cold ridge area are going to all starve. So you're going to get a recruitment failure. And then hypothesis number three was offshore paralarvae losses. You get all that, those dynamics from the Agullis current coming down off the off, on the outside of the Agullis bank, and this can cause havoc to the coastal uh, seas. Uh, mostly sort of like a Natal pulse will, we think, draws huge amounts of, of water offshore. And if it happens during summer, well, there go your larvae. They're gone and lost to the greater um, global oceans. So that was hypothesis number three. And then hypoth hypothesis four was looking at more ecosystem changes, some big shifts. There's a very famous one in 1996 that all of us know in South Africa, where it looked like the Agullis, current, uh, Agullis bank cooled down. And at that moment, all the small anchovies, sardines moved off the west coast and then moved, migrated from the west coast onto the south coast and caused absolutely collapse of the fishery on the west coast. So that's an example of that. So we've got Fatma who's going to talk a bit to, to H2, um, hypothesis two, and we've got Zoe who's going to talk to H3. Um, and then just to give you an overview for those of you not close um, to the project, the approach was very much along the idea that Solstice has this ability, a very strong ability to pull institutions together, something that we struggle with in South Africa. Um, and I think Solstice very, very, very successfully managed to pull 11 institutions, both in the UK and in South Africa, together to form a research team, very formidable research team. And through this collaboration, we were able to deploy a number of technologies that were at the heart of Solstice, Earth observations, that satellite observations, ocean models, which Katya is and Fatma and, and, and Zoe are very much involved with, and then robotics. Um, and then, of course, ships. And so the next couple of talks are going to embellish a little bit on what I've said. Uh, Julianne is going to talk about the robotics, which is I'm sure you'll find interesting. And the next talk actually is going to be Margot, or is it Katya? I know you need to. I'm not looking at my agenda. Where do you pop in now? Um, no, Mike, it's Margot's turn. It's Margot's turn. All right. So, Margot, I guess it's, it's over to you. I don't know if you're going automatic or if you're giving a manual talk. I've got the um, I've got a presentation from Margaret, so I'll just I'll I'll play the video for her. Great. That she sent me. So I'll just share that screen now, and then after that we'll have uh, Katya telling us about the special issue. Great. Hi everyone, I'm Margot Noyon and I work at Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. I will talk today about the Solstice Cruise on the Agulhas Bank. So we focus this cruise on the east and central Agulhas Bank that you can see here in the red circle. 
So the East and Central Achilles Bank is a relatively productive shelf C, as you can see with this satellite map of chlorophyll A. However, little data have been published on the bank itself. Most of this data are from November surveys, so from the spring surveys, and they were made to look at um, the biomass uh, of fish on the bank. And these papers are um, mostly from the 90s. So we wanted to go back and to have a bit of an update of what was going on on the bank and to better understand the functioning of the shelf ecosystem in autumn with a special focus on plankton ecology. We also um, wanted to estimate the particle fluxes on the bank and whether it could explain turbidity events and if there is a link or not um, with the squid fishery collapsing, as Mike explained earlier. So I will let you, um, with a quick video of an introduction done by Sarah Gearing um, as we were leaving Cape Town. Yeah, I'm so excited. Hi, we're just leaving Cork. We're just there. Yeah, exiting Cape Town and we're about to embark on a two-week um, cruise just along the South African coast on this beautiful research vessel, the Ellen. And um, yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> so um, the Ellen Koswayo, this is um, a picture of the vessel. Um, the vessel belongs to the South African government, to the Department of Fisheries and we wanted to sample um, on 12 cross shore transect that you can see here on the map. So that was a total of 63 station, but due to bad weather, we had to cancel the station, especially the one in Algoa Bay on the eastern side of the bank. And we ended up by having only 50 stations. So the team, um, good picture of, of us as we were leaving Cape Town. So we had three students on board, Tixolile Mazwane here, and Wabisa Malangweni, and Lisa Martinengo here. We had three technicians from three different institutes, Brian Godfrey, Patrick Foley, and Stephen Woodward, one intern um, from Nelson Mandela University, Rian Base, as well as three researchers, Sarah Gearing, um, that you see here that introduced the cruise, Alex Poulton from Harriet Watt University and myself from Mandela University. So during the cruise, we had um, various instruments um, that were deployed. So the first one was um, some drifters um, that were donated by the South African Weather for, um, Service. Um, we deployed them um, while we were steaming east, right at the start of the cruise. Then at each station, we deploy a CTD that you can see um, here on this picture, CTD rosette with the Niskin bottle in the middle uh, that uh, allows you to collect seawater sample, samples. We deploy zooplankton net like um, those ones here. We had the marine snow catcher that was deployed as well. Um, and finally, we recover a series of moorings here and three gliders. And I'm going to talk um, in more details about those operations. So the work um, on the station, the first thing we did was to deploy a CTD. So CTD stands for conductivity, temperature and depth. So here, those two pictures, you can see the dry lab where you have technician, researchers, students, all watching that little screen, which is a live feed of um, the um, conductivity and temperature data that are coming straight from the CTD. And um, once you look at that, you kind of have an idea of the structure of the water column. And that's when you decide you've got a few minutes to decide where to close your bottle to collect seawater samples. On the <clears throat> left hand side, you, send, you can see six alile collecting seawater from a specific water sample, um, which correspond to a specific depth. So we sampled during daytime and nighttime. Um, this is um, the Ellen Koswayo is a relatively small ship. So as soon as we had a bit of bad weather, wind, swell, um, the condition were getting a bit uh, more challenging. But we did, however, uh, overall managed to do um, to sample quite a lot of stations. So I wanted to add a little video of um, how the collaboration and the training part worked. So this is uh, Lisa Martinengo, one of our PhD students, 
who was collecting and analyzing for the first time dissolved oxygen um, from the Niskin bottle. And she was um, in this video, you'll see um, receiving a lot of help and um, experienced advices from Stephen from NSC. Yeah, so then what I normally do is, is turn the oxygen bottle upside down with the tube still in. So very hands on, and that was great to have um, Stephen on board. Really helped a lot of us. So um, once the seawater was collected from the Niskin bottle um, on the CTD rosette, the student would go back to the lab and the researchers. And um, you can see here all the series of filtration devices and the student busy working, fixing um, sample or um, labeling tubes and so on. So um, the seawater samples were filtered to uh, measure chlorophyll A, particulate organic carbon and nitrogen, as well as biogenic silicate. On the um, bottom right corner, you can see also some incubation system to measure primary production. And so we did a couple of, of those um, every morning during the cruise. So you can see here a marine snow catcher. So this is um, the, the kind of big tube here. This is just a weight to keep it um, heavy in the water. And this is a schematic of how it works. So you deploy the snow catch, the marine snow catch in the water, and then you close and you entrap all that water with all those little particles that you can see here. Then you um, bring it back on the ship and you leave it stand for two hours on the deck. And during those two hours, basically you're waiting for the particle to sediment, to sink. And from there, you can collect um, different uh, type of particles. So the top one would be suspended. The um, middle one would be the, the slow sinking particle. And the tray right at the bottom would contain um, a lot more fast sinking particles. And from those um, kind of measurement here, you can then um, start estimating uh, carbon fluxes in the in the water column. So the deployment of this marine snow catcher was sometimes pretty easy. As you can see here, the sea was very calm, no swell, sunny. Um, it was one of our lucky day. We were, um, not didn't even need more than two people to deploy it. But then you've got other moments like this day where the sea was something else and um, that was getting scary especially when you bring back the snow catcher and it's got all that water in it okay so this is um, the recovery of the of the moorings so we had four moorings in the water they had been there for six months and that's part of Lisa Martin Ingo PhD project and she was looking at the current on the central Agulhas bank and the current were measured, you can see in that boy, um, those ADCP, those yellow disc, um, to measure um, current in the water column. Then the last recovery we had to do was the gliders. Um, we recover them um, pretty smoothly for the two slocum here. So those are the yellow and purple track that you can see here. And the sea glider, that small um, glider that you can see here, unfortunately got into the Agulhas Cairn just before we, we got there to recover to recover it. And so that was a bit more of a challenge. It took us at least three hours to spot and try to get next to it and, and pick it up. So just um, for the fun of it, um, this is also what happened on a cruise. Um, Sarah Gearing and Brian Godfrey were um, helping each other. Brian was teaching Sarah how to make shackles out of Dyneema and um, that meant that we didn't need to use cable tires anymore, which was uh, a great discovery. Less plastic in the ocean. So that's it in the nutshell what um, happened on the Solstice Cruise in 2019. Thank you.
Right. Well, I think that was really a job well done there, Margot. That was really interesting. And you gave a superb overview of everything that happened on the cruise. So well done. Right. Katya, are you up next? I've lost track of the agenda. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then we've got a little bit of time for questions. So if anybody has any questions, if they could type them into the Q&A box, um, and then we'll come to those after, after Katya's presentation. Okay. Right, so all the research over last four years on Angola's bank by Solstice is now being pulled together into a special issue of the deep sea research, uh, which might call ecosystem functioning shift and future trends in the South African as squid fishery. So you see a prototype cover on the right, and this deep sea research special issue includes uh, international collaboration of nearly 50 courses with 20 planned papers. So at the moment, nine papers are in review. Eight papers are in advanced draft stage. So we're nearly there. So anticipated publication deadline of this special issue is uh, sometime in, our, in August 2022. What we all need to keep in mind is that everything in global publication process is seriously limited uh, by COVID. So everything is goes, goes much, much slower than usual. So we already about what a year delayed with the special issue, but it's it's uh, final hard cover, hard copy of volume may appear only by August. But one of the most uh, immense achievements uh, of this effort with publications is that eight papers uh, in this special issue are, are led by African early career scientists. So that is a huge effort by early career scientists themselves and the whole international partnership supporting them. So this deep sea research will include uh, papers on ocean dynamics, on biogeochemistry, marine robotics, ocean productivity, ocean modeling, socioeconomics, and fisheries management. And some papers, actually there will be about three of them will include all of the above. So it will be paper laying foundation for this, paper providing synthesis, including all hypotheses, and socioeconomic paper itself, which is sitting on results of all of uh, this. So uh, without further ado, then I'm passing uh, to Mike and Sarah Taylor with questions. So I stop sharing. Great, Katya. Great job there, nice and succinct. And I think you pulled out the golden nuggets on that one. Um, and as you say, it was a great achievement to have eight African early career researchers as lead authors there. So Adrian and Jean, that's that's hopefully the package that, uh, well, not hopefully, that you will be delivered uh, sometime next year. Sarah, well, that's Eva. kind of, I would say that is a primary research underpinning it. So now for some of us who are involved into predictive side of things and diagnostic side of things is for next three months is on the basis of this synthesis to assess what are we doing going forward with uh, possibilities for early warning system for squid low catches here. Yeah. So that this is coming, Jim. We, we, we're getting there, we're not there yet. It's just primary research right now being wrapped up, all individual studies. Cool. Okay, thanks for that, Katya. Sarah, I believe it's over to you. So I see that there aren't any questions in the actual Q&A box yet, but if anyone has any questions, you can type them into the box now onto the chat. But otherwise, it's open to the floor if anyone would like to raise their hand and ask a question.
Um, no, no questions. I, I try to put up my hand, but I can't. Uh, just a bit of a comment or a question ish. Uh, so when you're talking about offshore losses, let me just turn on my camera here. Offshore losses of Paralavi. I mean, did one of the things that I know has always been a, an issue is uh, the well, primary driver is the early retroflexion of the Agalas current because it seems to come and uh, it drives when it's a normal retroflexion, it comes and brings the Paralavi uh, and carries it into down to the cold ridge. I mean, that was the general hypothesis from before. But if, it ha if you have an early retroflexion, then the paralabi don't get that free ride to the cold ridge and they tend to be uh, swept off, off, uh, off the bank. I mean, was that, was that one of the things that you looked at or yeah. just looking at the Natal Pulse and uh, the Port Alfred upwelling system? I think Jean, uh, Zoe is going to give what I call the spaghetti talk. Um, she's gonna show very nice, um, what's going on there. So maybe just grab your popcorn and snuggle down into that seat and don't fall asleep yet. Okay, all right. And I'm actually, Jen, I'm smiling in this question because Zoe pressed submit button uh, on Friday on that paper answering exactly that question. Oh, okay, perfect. Let me grab my popcorn. <laughs> Moni, are we on time? Uh, sorry, I'm looking at my screen and I haven't pulled up that, that agenda. Are we on time or are we, we okay? Yep, we're, we're on good time. So if there are if there are any questions, we have time for, for a couple of questions. And if we haven't got any questions, then we can go to our five minute break. Okay. So just, just make sure that everyone's had the chance to say anything they want to say or speak to anyone they would like to speak to about the first, first set of presentations. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose the first section we've just had now is fairly straightforward. It's just really all the sort of background and, and bringing it together and what we did, et cetera. And now the next, is it four talks or five talks? There's four uh, talks coming up. Four talks. So that, that, that will delve in some detail, which, which will probably stimulate a bit of thinking there. So cool. All right, so, so can I just, quick yeah. one. So is, uh, is Margot going to present like about the marine snow catcher? Um, Lots out of that, you get an agenda. I my agenda tucked in here. Oh, there's uh, so there's a presentation from um, there's there's one from Brett on the from Brett. yep, yep. Then uh, there's one from, from Fatma, um, yep. one from Zoe, and then the final one is uh from Julianne, yep. okay. So Jean, All that's right. going to be your favorite topic. Brett's going to talk about, Fatma's going to talk about um, trying to find a link, catch, uh, explain catches in terms of some of the biophysical stuff. Zoe's going to give us the great spaghetti talk and the loss of paralavi you were just referring to. And Julianne's going to show us what some of the gliders did. So there's okay. the next four talks coming up. Okay, Amani, what time do you want us back? And um, so we'll just take five minutes. So that will be one minute past two in South Africa. Is that correct? <laughs> one minute past two. Yeah, I'll make sure I'm sitting down at one minute past. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'll see you all in five minutes. Um, if we're all back, then I'll kick off the next section of four talks with um, with a presentation from Brett, um, and um, I'll play the video, and then I'll stop, and Brett can jump in with a few kind of closing remarks on on conclusions on the talk. Um, so I'll just play that now. Hello, my name is Brett Johnson, and today I'm going to walk you through my SALSA study, which aims to improve our understanding of benthic turbidity at length and the resultant benthic nephroid layer on the eastern Gullis Bank 
South Africa. The harvest of the Ligurinati, as with many other cephalopods around the globe, is plagued by highly variable catch abundance on both annual and interannual timescales. Interannual variability is a factor of the strength of recruitment into the fishery, whilst monthly and even daily variability is closely linked to spawning behaviour, in particular as a response to short-term changes in environmental conditions. Variable catch abundance among cephalopods suggests that environmental effects on populations tend to be both distinct and at times temporary. But for the average paper catch squid fisherman in South Africa, this variability can have detrimental socioeconomic consequences. There has therefore been a need to re-examine the relationship between catch abundance and environment in order to build a predictive capacity in this fishery. Early observations made by scuba divers of a dense layer of particulate matter limiting visibility over important squid spawning sites brought about the hypothesis that benthic turbidity may be an important factor which influences squid spawning behaviour as subsequently catches. Analysis of 170 scientific dive records between 1992 and 1999 in St. Francis Bay, an important squid spawning site, showed that visibility near the seabed was less than one meter for a total of 50% of the dives over the decadal study. 18% of these dives recorded blackout conditions on the seafloor with, with visibility reduced to zero, whilst 39% of these dives showed visibility less than half a meter. These records highlight the stark variability in optical conditions on the favorable inshore spawning grounds of these commercially important squid. Now the Choco industry targets spawning aggregations within the nearshore environment of the Eastern Gullis Bank. In order to form these aggregations, Choco squid communicate by bioluminescence through neurally controlled pigments in their skin called chromatophores. The dirtier and less transparent the water column, the less likely they are to be able to see each other and thus form these aggregations. So what do I mean by turbidity? Turbidity is a measure of the optical clarity of the water column due to the presence of both organic and inorganic material and is a function of bottom turbulence, substrate and type, and detritus level. Due to the reliance of visual cues in the reproductive process of squid, turbid water conditions negatively influence the formation and duration of squid spawning aggregations on the eastern Nogales bank forcing them into deeper, clearer water where they become unavailable to the depth-limited hand jig fishery. This aspect of the study addresses the first hypothesis of the siphon case study, which was introduced to you by Prof. Mike Roberts earlier today. We analyzed the historical data set of benthic turbidity between 2002 and 2004 with an important squid spawning sites or embayments on the Eastern Gullet Bank namely Algoa Bay, St. Francis Bay, and Oborts. A 17-month time series was collected using optical backscattering instruments, which infer turbidity by emitting light and measuring the reflectance of suspended particulate matter in the water column. This was supplemented by extended bay experiments in St. Francis Bay and Oborts Bay, a more exposed part of the coastline. The relationship between benthic turbidity and underwater visibility was determined by divers as the distance from the standard secchi disc and the diver at the point in which the secchi disc becomes distorted. This highlights a negative correlation between NTU and underwater visibility. NTU or nephilometric turbidity units was not converted to concentrations of suspended particulate matter as a host of variables including packing structure, size, shape and color of aggregates and particles in the water column are unknown. Therefore, turbidity is used as a proxy for underwater clarity interchangeably in the study. Results from the Algoa Bay time series experiment show that turbidity events are common and occur in all seasons, encompassing a total of 30% of hourly readings over the sample period. This was broken down into three qualitative brackets, which best describe bottom turbidity in terms of the visual impairments of water clarity. The first, being clear conditions, exemplifying good underwater visibility, account for 70% of total readings. This is equivalent to 281 days of clear, sufficiently illuminated waters in which squid can spawn. Bottom turbidity ranged between 5 and 15 NTU, whilst not dense enough to produce blackout conditions on the benthos, is still representative of poor water clarity as a result of the suspension of both organic and inorganic material within the water column resulting in a net decrease in underwater visibility. 
These account for 25% of total readings over the 17 month sample period, or a total of 101 days. Bottom turbidity conditions equal and greater than 15 NTU represent severely disturbed underwater clarity conditions with underwater visibility of 0.5 meters or less account for 5% of total readings or equivalent to 20 days. The results of the extended bay studies of 2002 and 2003 respectively highlight the occurrence of both site-specific and concurrent turbidity events across the eastern Agalic Bank. From altimeter derived measurements of significant wave heights, there exists a strong relationship between turbidity events and increased roughness of the sea state, suggesting that upward flux of material as a result of bottom turbulence is a main driver of episodic benthic turbidity events on the eastern Agalis Bank. Exploration of environmental drivers, including the influence of wind, altimeter derived significant wave height, sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A concentration as a proxy for primary productivity, indicate that the benthic nephroid layer does not conform to a one-size-fits-all approach. Rather, complex local hydrological and physiochemical parameters control the BNL characteristics on the eastern Agalis bank. An example of the complex interplay between localized and large-scale forcing mechanisms can be summarized by looking at turbidity events spread across March 2013. Composite SST images highlight the propagation of the Natal Pulse down the East Nagalas Bank during the upwelling events on the 8th to the 13th of March, summarized in the little black box. This led to extreme coastal upwelling, first felt on the wild side of Cape Perceive, and then a delayed response in the in situ mooring. Following the week-long period of upwelling, subsequent productivity at the sea surface contributes to the marine snow environment, which enriches the nephroid layer at the benthos. Westerly component winds keep the organic material within Algo Bay, allowing for diffusive settling of particulate matter from the surface euphotic zone into the benthic nephroid layer. The second box shows that wave events of almost 4 meters coupled with strong southwesterly winds result in the resuspension of benthic nephroid material into the water column. This is just a general example of the complexity between large-scale, mesoscale, and small-scale environmental ability and stability events on the Eastern Gullis Bank. Sure. Um... Thanks everyone for listening to my talk. Um, all I wanted to add in the last slide um, is that moving from a qualitative to a more quantitative approach, future research needs to, um, needs to try and quantify and characterize the constituents, the source particles, and the spatial temporal variability of these stability and bends um, in order to build a predictive capacity. Um, so this can be achieved by incorporating these dynamics um, into oceanographic models, um, sort of general linear, general linear models, as well as particle distribution models. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for this nice talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I like the beard, Brett. After it's my sea beard. Like, you're gonna have to call me Blackbeard from now on. Yeah, well done on that one. <laughs> thank you. So I'll just move on to, um, Fatma's talk, and then we'll have time for questions at the end of the, these next few talks. Hi, I'm Dr. Fatma Jebri from the National Oceanography Center, and I'll be discussing links between squid catches and biophysical mechanism in South African waters based on satellite observations. The South African waters are characterized by complex dynamics caused by both oceanographic and atmospheric factors. As shown on these figures, the surface circulation connects the Agulhas current, which is a western boundary current, to the Benguela current, an eastern boundary current. The Agulhas current flows southwestward from 27 to about 40 degrees south, change in direction at its westernmost position where it reflects back as the Agulhas return current. Upwelling, which is a process that brings cold nutrients-rich waters to the surface, takes place along 
the west coast, so we have a, a south bang uh, southern Banguela upwelling highlighted here in green, and on the Agulhas Bank, known as the Cold Ridge, highlighted here in orange, during austral summer, so about from like October to April, when the intense northward and northwestward winds blow parallel to the south uh, west and south coasts. These productive waters help sustain rich ecosystems and fishing activities which play a major role in the certain coastal fishing communities. In particular, the choca squid fishing is crucial to the economic well-being of local communities. However, the squid biomass is prone to considerable fluctuations, including abrupt declines with negative socioeconomic impacts, such as in 2001 and 2013. Investigating changes in the marine environment can help understand drivers of low catches, especially given that environmental conditions influence the squid life cycle. Our first result shows that the, from 1998 to 2017, annual squid catches are significantly and positively correlated with satellite-derived chlorophyll A, which is an index of phytoplankton biomass, over the Agulhas Bank and the South African West Coast. This graph shows also that the low catch years of 2001 and 2013 are associated with low chlorophyll A, while the high catch years of 2004 and 2009 correspond to high chlorophyll A levels. Zooming in on the seasonal cycle of these variables during the extreme catch years and the climatology, two main phytoplankton blooms are observed. One occurring in the austral spring and the other in autumn, peaking in October and April respectively. The chlorophyll A variation of the years with catch declines are indicative of phenology issues with no apparent bloom in October 2001, an extremely low initiation and termination of the bloom in 2013, but I will expand on this point later. Moving on to the response of chlorophyll A to physical factor, chlorophyll A is found positively correlated to wind speed and negatively correlated to wind stress curl, which are indicative of the occurrence of wind-driven upwelling over coastal areas covering both the South African West Coast and the Central Agulhas Bank. Those areas are highlighted here with the blue contours. So we have A1, A2 and B1 covering the West Coast and A3 and B2 corresponding to the Central Agulhas Bank or the Coldridge area. But the question is, what was particular in the physical condition during the extreme catch years? To answer that, we examined the cumulative sums of the time series of chlorophyll A, wind stress curl, and wind speed anomalies during October, April 1998-2017. The chlorophyll A declines in 2001-2013 are seen in this, uh, those graphs to occur amid or at the start of a low phytoplankton biomass regime. They are induced by weak winds and relaxed negative wind stress curl over the Banguela upwelling area. So uh, here we have A1 and B1 graphs. Uh, so this, course, uh, this is for 2001. And over ba the Banguela and Coleridge upwelling areas in 2013. So that would be areas or graphs A1, A3, B1, and B2. In contrast, enhanced chlorophyll A in 2004 and 2009 are found induced by strong winds over the Banguela upwelling in Coldridge areas in 2004, uh, so that was uh, derived from uh, graphs A1 and A3, and by intensified negative wind stress curl over the Banguela upwelling area in 2009, so that, uh, that result is driven from graph B1. In addition to the changes in the physical uh, regime, the phytoplankton phenology which is the bloom timing uh, analysis revealed absent or shorter and uh, delayed bloom over the Banguela upwelling region in 2001 and both the Banguela and Coldridge upwelling areas in 2013. In contrast, the high catch years of 2004 and 2009 associated with elevated chlorophyll A 
coincided with early and or prolonged, uh, prolonged sorry, seasonal blooms. That brings me to the end of my presentation. So to summarize, the squid catch is positively correlated to chlorophyll A from year to year over the South African coastal waters. Phytoplankton availability is highly influenced by local wind forcing with the occurrence of wind driven upwelling over the South African West Coast and the central Agulhas Bank during October to April. The autumn and spring phytoplankton blooms show reduced chlorophyll A during the squid catch declines of 2001 and 2013, while elevated chlorophyll A levels are observed during the high catch years of 2004 and 2009. Years of squid catch declines linked to low chlorophyll A regimes are found driven by weak winds and relaxed winds, uh, negative wind stress curl over the Banguela upwelling area in 2001 in both the Banguela upwelling and Cold Ridge areas in 2013. Additionally, the phytoplankton phenology analysis indicates low phytoplankton availability with absent or shorter and delayed blooms over the Banguela upwelling area in 2001 in both the Banguela and Cold Ridge upwelling areas in 2013. These results derived from satellite remote sensing show that the squid catch fluctuations are potentially predictable and could support policymakers seeking to improve their planning of adaptation strategies and risk mitigation. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs. Hello, I'm Dr Zoe Jacobs from the National Oceanography Centre in the UK and I'm going to talk about the role of the Agulhas current in retention on the Agulhas bank and infer what that could mean for uh, chocolate squid power larvae. This is the only piece of work in the special issue that addresses hypothesis three, that off-shelf power larvae losses occur with unusual Agulhas current dynamics, which in simple terms hypothesizes that some kind of variability in the Agulhas current causes power larvae to get swept away, likely leading to widespread mortality and recruitment failure. As you'll have heard already, the main spawning sites for chocker squid are situated along the coast on the eastern Agulhas bank and part of the central Agulhas bank, where the shelf is quite narrow. After they have spawned, they travel to their main feeding grounds near the cold ridge in the prevailing westward currents. Now, if they don't make it to the cold ridge within about five days, they will starve. Um, the hypothesis being tested in this study looks at whether an increased interaction with the Agulhas current, whose mean position lies at the edge of the Agulhas bank, which is quite close to the spawning grounds, especially on the eastern Agulhas bank, um, can cause high losses of these power larvae before they are able to swim against the currents, again, leading to starvation. So to do this, I used uh, Lagrangian particle tracking in an ocean model where lots of virtual particles were released at the surface of the main spawning sites, seen here in red, at the beginning of every month from 1995 to 2012 and allowed to flow in the velocity field over a two month period. So uh, to be classed as retained on the bank, a 30 day threshold is chosen. Um, this is the approximate age where the squid are mature enough to be able to swim against the prevailing currents and find their own food sources. Um, it's just worth noting here that I've defined an east and west release region, which will be discussed in the coming slides. This shows the percent of particle loss from the Agulhas bank, which is defined as the uh, 200 meter isobath after 30 days for each monthly release. So you can see there's quite a lot of variability from month to month and high retention dominates overall with about three quarters of events uh, experiencing less than 10% particle loss, so over 90% retention on the bank. Um, while there are only four high loss events where more than 50% of particles are lost from the bank. This changes somewhat when you start to look at particle loss in relation to release location. So this is where the east and west divide comes in um, that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. So uh, straight away, you can see a huge difference between the release regions in terms of number of high loss events and the overall percentage of loss per event. Um, so there's a much higher retention for the west releases, likely due to reduced interaction with the Agulhas current, while the east releases undergo high loss events much more frequently, uh, with one event seeing nearly a complete wipeout at more than 96% loss, um, which is most likely due to the greater interaction with the Agulhas current. 
So before I get into what causes high losses, let's have a look at an example of a high retention event. Um, so the top plot shows a trajectory map, which allows us to visualize the pathways taken by the particles. Um, so each color represents uh, six days. So here you can see the initial rapid flow to the central Agulhas bank seen by the warmer red to orange colors. Then the particles hung around here for quite a while before disappearing off to the Benguela system on the west coast. So the slow currents on the bank here lead to 100% retention. Now I'll show some examples of high loss events, which are due to a different type of Agulhas current mode. Um, this event saw a 96% loss of particles from the Agulhas bank, and you can see the particles get entrained off the bank after about uh, 12 days and flow southwestwards away from the bank. Um, this was caused by a meander at the easternmost edge of the bank at the time of particle release, um, which you can see in the bottom plot. So I should have mentioned on a previous slide. So this is a snapshot, a five day mean of the currents um, around the time of release. Um, so, yeah, you can see this meander basically uh, dragged the particles offshore where the particles then continued to flow in the path of the uh, Agulhas current. Uh, this event had a loss of 78% of particles, and again, the majority are entrained in the Agulhas current, which um, picks, up the, picks up the particles or the paralave um, where they spawn, and then moves offshore as it progresses west, affecting the particles off the shelf with it. Um, so you can see the narrow band of particles following the Agulhas current there. This event saw a loss of 65% of particles, but it looks different from the other two where particles were lost from the eastern Agulhas bank. Um, as here, particles are rapidly affected across the bank before exiting at the tip of the bank at its southernmost point. So particles representing our chocolate squid paralave would reach the feeding grounds on the central Agulhas bank, but actually would get swept past it before they're able to swim against the currents. Um, so this situation was caused by the presence of a Natal pulse, which you can see in the bottom plot, um, which is kind of like a large meander formed further upstream of the Agulhas bank, which uh, causes the Agulhas current to be situated further onshore at this time. Uh, so the particles are swept across the bank quickly and then get lost from the ecosystem before 30 days. So to summarise, um, we found high variability exists in retention of virtual particles, which are used to represent chocolate squid paralarvae on the Agulhas bank. Um, greater retention occurs for those spawned further west, where there is a much higher risk of loss uh, if it occurs further east due to um, increased interaction with the Agulhas current. Um, so overall, the most common situation is high retention, um, but there are occasional high loss events caused by variations in the Agulhas current. Um, specifically, when there is a meander at the eastern edge of the Agulhas bank, when there is an Agulhas current that's positioned further offshore, so south of the Agulhas bank, and when it's positioned further onshore, which is associated with the Natal pulse. Interestingly, um, and I'm not going to get into too much detail here, um, but it looks like the different stages of an Atel pulse can cause differences in the retention. So early stages, as we saw here, cause high losses, um, but a month or two after it passes, it can lead to high retention um, as the current remains on the bank, um, but it's much slower, um, leading to a situation where we see very high retention, like one of the examples I showed earlier. Um, so while these events aren't as common, occurring only a couple of times a year, um, if they do occur at the time of peak spawning, it could lead to recruitment failure, which may affect the catch. Um, and it's important to note that although the model does a good job of representing the Agulhas current and the currents on the bank, uh, this study was used to understand how the Agulhas current could contribute to offshore losses rather than match up the exact timing of specific events. Um, so further work should be done um, to understand the frequency of such events in reality um, with the potential to put an early warning system in place. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Julianne Wiscott and I would like to tell you more about a robotic mission to study the oxygen dynamics on the South African continental shelf as part of the Solstice program. The Agulhas current is the largest western boundary current in the southern hemisphere. It originates in the Indian Ocean and carries large amounts of warm saline water towards the pole. The dynamics of the Agulhas current change drastically as the continental shelf of Southeast Africa widens west of 27 degrees east onto the Agulhas bank. Here the Agulhas current departs from the African coast, 
starts to exhibit large meanders and interacts with the southeastern margin of the Gulas Bank. This drives energetic upwelling of cold and nutrient-rich South Indian central water at the continental shelf edge, which helps to maintain very strong vertical temperature gradients on the bank, and the input of nutrients helps to fuel high primary productivity on the shelf, which sustains productive fisheries that directly support the livelihoods of regional coastal communities. Simultaneously, however, this upward South Indian central water is also low in dissolved oxygen. This is important because dissolved oxygen is a key indicator for ecosystem health and concentrations of dissolved oxygen have been shown to decline worldwide in both the coastal and the open ocean since the middle of the last century. This trend is largely attributed to global warming and general circulation models predict this decline to increase in response to future climate change. The implications of this upwelling on the oxygen dynamics of the Igolas Bank are therefore complex and previously unknown, and implications for regional ocean health require further investigation. I will now introduce you to the fieldwork we undertook in March 2019. To investigate the oxygen dynamics on the eastern and central Agulas Bank, we used a combination of buoyancy-driven ocean robots, also known as ocean gliders, a traditional ship survey and reanalysis wind data. Using a locally chartered vessel, we deployed three specialist ocean gliders in the vicinity of a well-known upwelling location south of Port Alfred, which is in the top right corner of the map. The different coloured lines show the path each glider took with reference to the sampling stations of the ship survey that was conducted at the same time and eventually recovered all three gliders. Over a two week period, we collected vertical profiles of temperature and salinity, dissolved oxygen concentrations, ocean turbulence, which is how much energy is available for ocean mixing, chlorophyll efflorescence, as well as nitrate concentrations. All of these new measurements amount to over five and a half million new data points. The reducing concentrations of dissolved oxygen can have many harmful effects on the whole marine ecosystem. Hypoxia marks the level where fisheries collapse, yet many organisms already experience stress at much higher concentrations, depending on the energy demands. To take account of this varied response among many marine organisms to distress, the following threshold has been widely used within marine regions by defining areas with a dissolved oxygen concentration of less than 192 micromoles per kilogram as oxygen deficient. And we would also use this threshold here for our work. We will now look at the main results of this work. We confirm the presence of cold, nutrient-rich water that is characteristic of South Indian central water across large areas of our study region. We observed several instances of active upwelling of South Indian central water near the continental shelf edge that is likely due to the interaction of the Gulas current with the shelf break. This upward layer of South Indian central water contributes to the strong and persistent vertical temperature gradient that we observed to strengthen westward and also a general decline we see dissolved oxygen concentrations from east to west at all depths. We were surprised to find the widespread occurrence of oxygen deficient conditions across the eastern and central Gulas Bank. Oxygen deficient conditions were found within three quarters of all glider profiles and within each of the survey transects taken across the Gulas Bank that are shown here on the right hand side and the oxygen deficient areas are bounded by the dashed line. We next wanted to understand what physical processes control the temperature and oxygen dynamics away from the upwelling and the shelf edge. And using reanalysis wind data, we know strong pulses of diverging wind fields lead to coastal upwelling, and thereby lifting nutrient rich water to the surface, which fuels primary production. We observed a particular instance of this during the campaign and noted strong primary productivity in surface waters following this wind event on the 14th of March, 2019. 
We also see evidence of this in the oxygen data, where we observed the maximum dissolved oxygen concentration during the entire campaign. Interestingly, however, we observed the lowest concentration of dissolved oxygen ever recorded on the eastern Nicolas bank almost directly afterwards. Furthermore, this minimum is below the habitat threshold of a regionally important commercial fishery, which has experienced devastating crashes in annual catch on recent decades. The connection between increased nutrients and low oxygen concentration is an important point which often gets overlooked when the upwelling of nutrients is discussed on the eastern and central Kulos bank. While nutrients will increase biological activity causing an increase in dissolved oxygen production in surface waters, oxygen consumed during the decay of biological organic matter leads to a subsequent decrease in dissolved oxygen. So what does this mean for the future of the Ecolas Bank? We propose that predicted future climate change will act to worsen the already low dissolved oxygen inventory of the Ecolas Bank. Reported broadening of the Ecolas current could lead to an increase in upwelling, and global circulation models predict coastal thermal stratification to strengthen. These factors pose a significant threat to regional fisheries by promoting further deoxygenation which will further be intensified by the reduced solubility of dissolved oxygen due to the predicted warming ocean. To summarise our results, we have shown that shelf edge upwelling of South Indian central water onto the eastern and central Gorlivus Bank preconditions the shelf with cold, nutrient-rich, low oxygen water. This leads to strong vertical temperature gradients, high nutrient concentrations, yet large areas experience oxygen deficient conditions. We have also shown that coastal upwelling due to the prevailing winds is likely dominant control on primary production by lifting nutrient water into the light lit surface layer of the ocean. Crucially, however, we find that strong primary production events fueled by coastal upwelling likely leads to a decline in dissolved oxygen concentrations on the Egolos Bank. The changing nature of the Gulas Bank's upwelling and its accelerating deoxygenation discussed in the study presents an alarming example of the future fate of productive boundary upwelling systems and their continuous climate change. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Right, well, everyone's still there? Um, okay, great, that was four lovely talks. Well done everyone for, for preparing those. I know they take a long time and I thought they were excellent, all of them. Sarah Taylor, are you not supposed to be doing a question and answer session here? Sorry, Mike, Sarah is not feeling very well, so she dropped off, she's just back from Europe, so. Oh, okay. Okay. So there is Great. only one. I'm happy to assist you with questions. So there is only one question right now, and that's question to Zoe. Zoe, you already saw it. Cool. Jump in. Yeah. So um, thank you for your question. So there, there is actually a seasonal cycle for the. Uh, uh, sorry, Zoe. We need we need to read the question first. Not everyone saw it. Sure. So. Um, so the question is, the time series of particle retention looks very stochastic, but is there any um, cyclicity within it? So some seasonal signal, or are these Nidhau pulses completely random? So yeah, so the first kind of part of the question. So there is some seasonal cycle for the east releases, um, but not the west releases, which straight away implies that this is something to do with the Agulas current. So um, there are, if I can remember, there is um, a much greater loss of particles during the southern hemisphere winter, so from kind of June to August, um, and this um, this coincides with when the Agulhas current is actually weaker. Um, I did have a look at um, if the if this seasonal cycle was due to any kind of change in the position of the Agulhas current. Um, I only looked um, probably further 
further quite close to the spawning areas and I couldn't really see anything there at all um but this might just be due to the fact that it's getting masked by the kind of large um meanders on our tail pulses might be skewing the results a bit so that the the, the kind of seasonality needs a little bit more work definitely but there, there, there is some seasonal um cycle going on um as for the Natal pulses they are as far as I'm aware they are completely random um, and I don't think there's there's definitely nothing in the literature at the moment that suggests there's any seasonality to those um but that is something that I would like to investigate in future and I'm actually hoping to get a master's student next summer to look into all of these um Natal pulses and meanders but in the observation so using satellite altimetry data to understand just how frequently they do appear along the coast um, of the Agulhas Bank um, yeah and then hopefully that will help in terms of potential prediction as well if we can understand how frequently they're coming down the coast which could suggest um, the frequency of off high offshore losses and whether that can coincide with um, peak spawning and things like that. Uh, thanks, Zoe. If there are further questions, you can type them in. Uh, Mike, just to let you know that the panel cannot type questions in, only uh, attendees can. So maybe if we, uh, there is no more questions written in, into the box. So if we just open the floor to the rest of the panel for questions. Okay. Including Mike himself. Yes. Thanks. Um... I've got a question, but is there anyone else who wants to go first? My question is for Juliana. Um, Julianne, um, I, I was trying to have a look at your, your vertical and your oxygen horizontal, I mean, your vertical sections. Did you see any evidence of waves, internal waves in, in that data. I know we'd spoken about it before, but it was quite preliminary. And now I guess you've finished your analysis. Any hints? Hi, Hi Mike. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, good point. Uh, Agulhas, uh, internal waves are a common feature on um, stratified HLCs, particularly where they are uh, close, with such strong stratification and when they're strong uh, forcing. Um, you're right to point out that um, we did mention them in the preliminary results a while ago, and you can see them in the temperature data that there is uh, something that does indicate our oscillations of the pignocline, um, likely driven by, uh, as I said, interaction of the strong stratification on the shelf with uh, forcing um, likely from a shelf break or maybe tides. Uh, onto the shelf break. Um, our work, however, into the oxygen dynamics hasn't really considered internal waves under uh, any great detail. So other than I telling you that they are present there and the amplitudes are probably on the order of 10 meters. Um, I haven't done much more research into them. Okay. So it's something we need to flag because at the moment, the, the published knowledge says that we find them regularly on the Western Nogales Bank. And in fact, uh, I can't remember it so long ago, Lagier did the work. I can't remember if he showed that they actually show um, and actually break and are quite a major mixing mechanism um, of, of you know, getting nutrients into the upper mixed layer. Absolutely. Be really nice. Even Absolutely. if you can show that they exist, I think in your manuscript, if you could just maybe just drop a, a couple of sentences saying they are there, we're finding them, and then someone can pick it up. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, uh, just as flag as well. So uh, the glider data from where we saw the internal waves in, that unfortunately finished um, probably just at the edge of the central coolest bank. So we didn't actually take any measurements on really on the central Agulhas Bank. Most of our glider measurements focus on the eastern Agulhas Bank, but there there's certainly some evidence of uh, those internal waves. But yeah. So thanks for the tip. Yeah. And then not to hog the floor, but maybe I am going to hog the floor. Fatma, this one's for you. I mean, I'd read your paper before and I found it fascinating that you were able to find this correlation between catches, squid catches and 
and a very broad sort of view and measurement of chlorophyll. And that's great. I mean, that's how science works out. You, you try, I would have gone into a more sort of um, zoomed in um, approach. But, but what I, I, I find difficult to interpret is, is ordinarily we would expect a decrease in chlorophyll, i.e. in productivity, I guess, in the ocean. Uh, uh, you'd find a one year lag between the drop in productivity and then you'd see one year later, you'd the drop in catches because of the life cycle, you know, the guys growing up and feeding. Sort of what's your, your view on that? Yeah, I know it, um, that point in particular can be tricky. Um, the thing is like when we done our statistical analysis, uh, the highest, uh, most significant correlation that we found what a zero lag, meaning it's occurring within a year. Um, and the result that we present, it's on annual scale, meaning that we didn't necessarily investigate um, further, like a more detailed time scale, not, not necessarily on a daily or a monthly basis, but we can, what we can um, infer from those results is that if it's within a year, then it's coherent with the age uh, of the spawning squid aggregation, uh, because from the literature it's less than one year old, uh, their age, and those are targeted by the fishing industries. Um, it also suggests that um, low chlorophyll A uh, are available at the wrong time of the year, so that could be six, 10, 12 months, but this is not, of course, specified in the paper. Those can have negative consequences on the adult squid. The example, they can migrate elsewhere or do not form spawning aggregations. And those possibilities are kind of brought up in the discussion of the paper, but we do not firmly confirm those. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Katia? I see Jim has a uh, hand raised, uh, probably in the yeah. discussion to Fatma. Yeah, no, it was just to kind of agree with Fatma. I know before we've, uh, you know, the life cycle of squid has been uh, said to be between 12 and 18 months. Mm -hmm. But especially from uh, data that we've collected from the closed season, looking at aging, it is, it tends to be uh, 364 days. So it's like about a year. So mm -hmm. where previously what Mike was suggesting that you would see, you would expect to see a lag phase between the productivity in terms of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A um, linked to uh, catches, you, you then you don't see that because everything happens within a, a one year time span. So I think that kind of makes sense, but it's only because the literature has been reviewed. And before we used to say that the lifespan mm -hmm. of squid was between 12 to 18 months, but now we found it's uh, actually less than a year. Yeah. So, so then I hope you're not going to get me in trouble. Can I quote this now? Because, you know, I've always taken my cues of Warwick, who was the godfather and Johann Augustin, of course, um, of squid biology. Yeah. And we don't want to get shot down. Is it 12 months now? Is that the conventional wisdom? Yeah. If we, there's a paper that we published uh, last year. Sorry for the noise outside. Um, yeah. We published a paper last year. We've been collecting, um, uh, we reanalyzed uh, satellite data. Uh, from uh, 2003, 2004, and that's that's the info, that's the data that we got. That's the lifespan. So, and also we are seeing now that uh, since we started closing the fishery from around 2014, that the this the mantle length of the females that we're catching during this time, November, December, is smaller, but they're mature. So they seem to be even the maturity. Uh, uh, data that we got from that is, is a little bit different from what's been published. So that's the updated data. I think um, it's uh, Marek. We had two students, so it's two papers that we published with Marek last year. We'll have that updated information. And to support further what Jean was saying, like also the paper that we are citing and uh, the results that I showed it dates also from 2020, so that could be the same paper. I don't know, but yeah, it's yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a Lipinski paper, yeah, exactly. It's, Lipinski it's, paper, it's, absolutely, yeah, yeah. All right, and Mike. Oh, sorry, 
My Go ahead, also, don't forget uh, the study by uh, Jorn Brugman, uh, which is also in this special issue, which clearly shows you that the highest predictability, the highest correlation happens at nine months between uh, peak in productivity and peak in uh, biomass. So it, it's nine months, which is uh, golden. Uh, which is within a year as well. So it's yeah. coherent. He got his mm. greatest correlation between, I, I think it was 82 millimeters, which was two months old, um, and so-called productivity. But it doesn't matter. I mean, the point is, Jorn's paper really, I mean, it's a great paper. It's, it's some, so it did some really good stuff. Um, Brett, uh, you're still there. I was just wondering, just picking up on your talk there about the end. So you found a ish, I mean, you obviously needed a hell of a lot more turbidity data, but you showed uh, that there are occurrences of high chlorophyll events determined by satellite imagery and, and uh, turbidity events as waves. But the wave data was showing that it stirred up the seabed during winter, which you'd expect, big swells stirring up the... Um, so I gathered from that that turbidity, yes, it, it, it can be driven by waves, but that mainly happens during winter when spawning is not happening. So I took home the message that really it's, it's chlorophyll, if you can link chlorophyll to the nephloid layer, which is maybe the predictive mechanism for, for, for stability. Is that right? Yeah, Mark, I agree with you, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But also just to add, I mean, you know, again, we've also said that there's two peak spawning seasons, but when we looked at the aging data as well, we, sh we you know, the squid are spawning all year round. So there's no clear peak um, and when uh, Marek, uh, when we presented these results at our scientific working group research uh, meeting, I think it was a year and a half ago, this, this, uh, this was pointed out as a real problem because it's one of the things that, you know, in um, biology, uh, you're supposed to determine how frequently your study species spawns. And that's something that should have been done a long time ago. So, but the data showed that there's no clear pattern there seems to be a little bit of a higher spawning during, obviously now in summer, but they spawn all year round. So, which was another, at least from the aging data that we got using uh, analyzing the satellites, which means maybe we need to analyze more, but that's what we got, which was a surprising result. Mm. So. Yeah, as always, I mean, this species, as we know, is probably the most studied cephalopod species on the planet and yet every time we creep up with more like this this is a huge deluge of information and we just end up with a whole lot of more questions <laughs> and now it's the most surveyed as well in the world yeah yeah abs absolutely so we've got uh, let me just have a look here we've got nine minutes left and what i was thinking about is is you can see gene and and adrian are you still there adrian I uh, think you are. I can see your your name. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see we are tantalizingly moving towards predictive capabilities in some ways. And and there's two ways that that I see that happening. Is one you can run what we call operational oceanography models. So you have these models that uh, Zoe and others have been using. Um, and you push them with observation data. Uh, so you try and ground truth the models and then they, they can have a certain amount of predictability. Um, so that's the one way. The other way that you might have uh, seen there is that we look at these, these uh, low catches and then we try and correlate them with some perturbation in the environment, like Fatma was showing with the, the chlorophyll. Uh, and Zoe was showing with the spaghetti plots, you know, so we can see an atoll pulse two months beforehand. Uh, we can see it's forming by satellite observations up near Durban, and we can follow it all the way down. It travels at 20 kilometers a day. So there's a certain amount of predictability there, but to actually forecast when that natal pulse is going to pop out. Now that's a hard one. 
that is hard. Um, so, so that's the one thing. And then the other thing we couldn't, we could only fit in so many talks here, but, but there was another paper that we didn't highlight um, by Sarah Asda that, that took quite a large um, model that was pushed forward in time and, and it was able to do a projection and that's Katia's group doing that. But again, you know, um, the interesting thing, Gene, you picked up on it that, that we need to think about. So the model shows uh, some increase in temperature over the next 80 years. It shows a bit of a decrease in productivity, although, although that's uh, arguably maybe not significant. Um, but I mean, with other parts, we compare this work to, to the tropical West Indian Ocean and it's going ballistic up there. I mean, climate change is big time, obviously, because it's a lot, lot hotter, a lot warmer. South Africa is further down south and so it's cooler, you know, the warming is not going to be quite as dramatic. So, so you've got this um, slightly cooling effect, but you're still going to get climate change. You're still going to get an increase in temperature. Now I've got to finish almost, Jess has almost finished her paper. She'll hopefully submit it on Friday. And if you have a look at her work, she's taken the temperature projections from Sarah Asda's model, and she's got her own sort of linear equation, and she's predicting, if I remember correctly, like a 50% drop and catch over the next 80 years. This is serious, Gene. This is hell yep. of a serious. If you talk about the small scale fishes, number one, old Adrian there is jumping around in a seat there because he's worried about you know, his huge investment and in capital and everything. And this is the story, you know, is that I remember talking to a minister in Mozambique years ago and she said, Michael, you want me to move three and a half million people just how certain are you of your data? You know, and I'll never forget that question. I'll never forget it. Um, so it, it goes back, Adrian, Jean, uh, but particularly Adrian, you, you know, we need to reflect on just how good we think our science is. I don't know if that has stimulated any thinking amongst you a lot. Uh, Mike, if I may uh, make a comment. Sure. So, um, yes, there is that huge gap between uh, two classes of models, our kind of operational capability, which can give you a warning, but a very short term warning, and then a longer term capability, a climate change capability, which gives you much vaguer picture, but for much further in advance, but again, you cannot rely on it for anything on the decadal time scale. So you can say the general trend is goes this way. You cannot say exactly when it start really hitting you because it comes with extreme events. That's the nature of it. It's never goes slowly. It goes with extreme, occasional extreme year indicates an occasional few extreme years indicate and then it switches to a different regime if that is how it's kind of to be on the gulas bank i think one thing which you didn't mention about sarah as the paper climate change impact which says okay yes yeah, there is a temperature rise you tell where there is a limits in which boundaries could survive primary production not the biggest concern longer term on the gulas but one is of concern is dynamics of the gulas itself, which seems to be moving closer onto the bank with potentially retention loss. So that's what Zoe was showing me right now, that retention loss comes in extreme events. Mm -hmm. So that's something which we need to kind of look for. And the earlier we put this predictive, start putting this predictive system in place, the better, because it takes time to adjust the system, to gain trust in the system before you actually use it operationally for management. It needs to exist a few years to demonstrate its validity and get going with this. So don't wait until it's conclusive and 100% correct before you start implementing it. And then, of course, we bring in pretty Greg Christie's not here because he's always a pessimist, but um, on science anyway. And Greg will say, guys, this is wonderful. You've shown all this stuff. But remember that squid, cephalopods, have the highest plasticity in life cycle than any other species on the planet, Gene, because of 
What do you say to them? Yeah. Um, Nullify. Yeah. Well, he's. Yeah, he, he's right. And I think one of the things that, that would certainly be useful for us uh, in research is to, for example, with the Agalas current, is to ground truth that that's easy enough to, I would imagine, would be easy enough to do before, you know, proceeding with further uh, modeling and stuff is to, to ground truth that. Because once you ground truth that, then it's easy, then it's, then it's possible to then relate what we've seen modeled and then previous events and then be able to better uh, have the ability to better predict, um, you know, how the movement of the Agalas current is going to affect retention on the Agalas bank, and then how that's going to impact future recruitment and catches. So I think it's like this whole uh, project and, you know, with all species, like eating an elephant, we've just been taking little bites. I mean, so uh, with time, we might be able to have taken off enough chunks. So for me personally, what I'd like to see is that uh, that ground truth thing of the Agalus uh, current model. And uh, I'd like to see, especially the chlorophyll one that paper published, because it's something that we uh, that's, that would be useful for us in terms of management, uh, because we can see how we can build the two and try to get some sort of predictive uh, capacity. The other thing that would be really useful is to look at what chlorophyll is doing now, because it's something that's happened on the Agalas bank, because uh, in the beginning, the introduction says that uh, most of the vessels, the, the, cut, the, the squid vessels go out for at least three weeks at a time. We've been out for three weeks. So if I was a squid fisherman and I've been out for the last three weeks and come back with the kind of results that we've gotten, it would have been, you know, okay, granted we're following a, a you know, a survey, line but um, we had two catcher vessels two commercial vessels that were out there going to uh, particular spots where they traditionally and historically catch squid and there was there was really nothing but there was a strong persistent groundswell for the first two weeks that we were out there so how do we measure groundswell it's not difficult because that because that was a major thing that we that was there um, was very persistent the first two weeks. I know we've had groundswell. Usually it lasts two to three days and then it's gone. But the undercurrent was really strong and it's across the bank. So um, so certainly from what we've observed the last three weeks, relating that to uh, you know the snapshots that you got in 2019 would certainly help us better manage the fishery. So yeah. That's good. Jane, it's good to hear from you, stakeholder. Adrian. Uh, Jean, did the did the two survey vessels catch their 10 tons or did they struggle? No, they caught their 10 tons. Okay, so yeah. Especially Craig. He, he was not our catcher vessel, he was a scouting vessel for himself. <laughs> but they caught they uh, caught they caught their caught. 10 tons. Yeah, I think I mean historically I think a lot depends on the wind um and and so even some years we find that it that the signs look good in the closed season and then you go out and the fishing is sporadic and other years things change and what looked like it was going to be terrible two weeks later is suddenly a great season so in about three weeks time you can ask me and i'll tell you what what happened because they will go out tomorrow we're, ho we're hoping it uh, at least for the rest of november that uh, things remain quiet other it's, it's going to be very weird explaining that uh, but I, I i think you're going to have a pretty good harvest this year okay i think it's just delayed spawn which is the other thing is that you know the close season has been set in five weeks in the same time every year for the last 20 25 years obviously squid don't have that memo so they come in when they're ready so we could have missed the timing a little bit timing bus yeah I think we'd be, we'd be interested to see, Mike, if you can put all the different things together to get the predictability sort of, and also to tell us where to go when the, if the squid are moving, because that's that's one of the questions is that if the if the food source on the gallus is shifting slightly, will the squid do something like the pulchids and end up on the west coast instead of the east coast in ten years' time? Um, so. No. So one of the jobs I we've got to do. No. 
Sorry, Jean. No, no, they wouldn't because um, the, 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 we, saw, we found lots of pelagics, but the thing is that with squid is that even um, we did find uh, little aggregates and uh, uh, what one catch vessel skipper was calling loose squid. So they're just, they're not yet aggregated. They're just little groups all over the place, but it's very much related to the substrate. So where we have a huge, a, a long patch of like rocky ground, there was like nothing. And if you look at the catches, if you plot the catches, which we did over historical catches over the entire coastline, you'll see that area, there's hardly any catches in that area, which means that they don't spawn there because of the ground. So they need a sandy substrate. Yeah, so chances okay. of you finding squid eventually shifting is, um, they're very uh, specific in where they spawn. Okay. Gee, I must say, it's lovely watching you grow in your scientific career. You're really becoming quite knowledgeable on all of this now. Originally, as the as the PhD student, eh? <laughs> yeah, the original PhD student for for squid, yeah, <laughs> for the fun. Um, we we've been speaking a lot amongst ourselves. What about the rest of the floor? Anyone else would like to butt in or chip in or? No, I don't see. Okay. It's time anyway. No, I think it's time. We've gone over a little bit, Amani, as the uh, as the rule ruler. Um, yeah. So I mean, just maybe we should wrap it up. I, I think you know you can see that it's been a wonderful collection of of studies we've done from the uh, oceanography, ocean production side, physics, etc., going right through to predictability, all the sort of things we mentioned in those hypotheses. And so we look forward to getting that special issue out. As Kati was saying, we are running very far behind, uh, but we'll get it out, which is great. Um, how we get that information gene into the squid working group and into the fishery, I guess, you know, we need to just reflect a little bit on that. Obviously we'll get the, um, the, the special issue out, they will probably be a policy brief or two, Katya, I know you love those, um, to, to get them out. And at the moment, Jean, have you finished writing all the new policy? Yeah, uh, they've been gazetted, but they, you know, we can still review them. They're going to be reviewed, I think, uh, in a couple of years' time, so, but they've been gazetted. Okay. But there's room for review, obviously. So uh, it's very important that we get, at least for the squid sector, I mean, that's my goal, is to make sure that this science gets translated into governance. Cool. That's what we want to hear. Hey, Katya? Between uh, January and March, we will work on predictive system as well as uh, synthesis of all the special issue, but that predictability component will start producing output between January and March with recommendation. But I also wanted, uh, guys, to draw your attention to the webinar next week on technologies in which will be a talk by Fatma Jebre on the use of machine learning uh, to diagnose various modes of variability of agulous branches on agulous bank, uh, which is another step towards predictability in respect to unusual dynamics of the agulous current. So there will be one South African talk then. Great. 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 All right. Okay, Amani. Do you want to wrap it up? You can wrap it up if you want, Mike. Um, okay. We're losing people to other meetings now, so yeah, we better, we better wrap up now. No, I think we've wrapped up. I think Jean and Adrian have wrapped it up quite nicely, being stakeholders. And so um, I think it's a natural ending. Yeah, right. It's really good to have that nice discussion at the end there, um, you know, around all the work that's been done. So yeah. yeah. It was, it was nice that we, we had that gap. We didn't have to just finish the last talk and close. So we had a, yeah, yeah it, was, it was really nice. It worked out well. Okay, guys, see you around, I guess. Right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, guys. Everyone. Everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone. Ted. Yes. Right. Just two of us left. How are you feeling, Amani? Are you okay?